Hi, and welcome to Dockside with Deb. In this weekly show, we'll talk to people who are doing some pretty cool things in sailing and experts in their field. I'm Deborah Diel, sailor, founder of MySail, and your host for today. Dockside with Deb is recorded live, so you can join in and ask your own questions. To find out more, head to mysail.team slash Dockside with Deb. Let's get started. Hi Alice, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Good, um, thanks for joining in. Um, we've got a few people, um, a few of our audience members signed in and we'll just maybe give them a couple more minutes to uh, for everyone to get signed in. Yeah, sounds good. I was like, oh, I hope this works. <laughs> yeah, we've just, uh, I've just set up a new um, webinar system. So yeah, just, uh, this is our trial run. So apologies if oh. we have any issues. <laughs> Ah, so far so good. So easy to get in. It's awesome. Yeah, it's been it's been heaps better than my last one. I won't say which the last one is, but yeah, this one is pretty much better. <laughs> so much better. Cool. Awesome. How was your day then? Yeah, it's been so busy. <laughs> um, That's good. <laughs> it is good. Like, it is good. We've had like a few quiet patches, but now it's starting to get a bit busier again. And yeah, so I've just been literally running till now. <laughs> Oh, that's so good. Okay, um, look, guys, it's seven o'clock, so uh, we've got a few people signed in, and a few more people will will join us as we go. Usually, people kind of come in and go out as they like. And um, the last few times, I've tried to stream this live on Facebook, and that hasn't worked either. But I think it looks like we have it set up and good to go. So I'm just going to start that. Let I'll just let that sign in, and then we'll we'll kick off. Okay, guys. So yes, we're now um, streaming live on Facebook as well. And so thank you so much, everyone for joining in. Thank you. Huge thank you to Alice um, for giving us some of her time. Um, so I just want to um, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so we've got Updated this system for the people who were joined us the last few weeks. You were able to um, kind of join in the conversation. Uh, with this new system, you can't join in the conversation so much, but you can still ask questions and then we can uh, answer the questions for you. So there's a little QA section. Uh, just click on that at any time to ask a question, and, and Alice and I can see that and I'll pull it up and, and we can still answer those questions for you. Um, and yeah, besides that, we'll get going. I'll, I'll, I just wanted to give Alice a little bit of an introduction. So Alice and I met, I don't know, a few years ago, I guess, sailing together. Um, and it was always such a pleasure to sail with Alice. So I'm really glad she's coming, um, came uh, to join us today. So Alice um, has quite a few, and you know what, instead of me going through some of your experience, I think it's probably best if, I let you do that because you can talk to it a lot better than I can. But Alice has done a lot of kind of competitive one design mat tracing, um, as well as some offshore sailing as well. Um, and maybe let's just start by giving us a little bit of an introduction about your background. How, how did you get started in sailing and what kind of was your some of your early journey? Oh, thanks, Deb. Thanks for having me. Um, such a pleasure. Um, yeah, so I started sailing when I was maybe 10 or 11 years old um, and I started through the centre board route. So I jumped into a Pitwater Junior um, and sailed out of Byra and I was sort of introduced through family, sort of through cousins, through mum and dad, um, loved it. Um, and so if you don't know a lot about me, I grew up in the Blue Mountains, so um, there's not a lot of water around the Blue Mountains. So we used to travel down on the weekends and mum, dad and I would kind of just um, do the sailing thing on the weekends. And then I'd run home on a Sunday night, do all my homework <laughs> and go to school on the Monday. Um, but yeah, I really loved it. So started in that sort of sphere and then um, got to Opti's, did the laser thing, Flying 11s. And then I got into the youth development program at the Royal Prince Alfred Yacht Club. Um, and that's where everything kind of really took off. Um, so that's where I sort of started to get more involved in some one design stuff, a bit of club racing and match racing. Um, and so with the match racing, um, it's a really, really cool way to get a bit of experience and also to travel. So we got to go and do regattas over in New Zealand, um, over in Europe, um, kind of in Asia as well and then from there I so there's an age limit with your mat tracing stuff so I got to the age limit which is 23 and then started moving into a lot more one design stuff so now I'm doing a lot more sort of etchels, spa 40s and a little bit of a Carnegie 38 stuff. 
Okay. Yeah, nice. Um, and I was going to say, a lot of our audience, they may not have done any kind of youth sailing because a lot of people, some people got into it when they were kids and some people got into it as adults. Talk us through some of the training that you would have done as in the youth program and how that kind of worked and how that maybe helped your progression into what you're doing these days. Yeah, so I think I'm pretty lucky with it. Um, because when you're going through these programs, you, you're allowed to make mistakes, you're allowed to sort of bounce off each other and you're allowed to ask the silly questions. Um, so what, what it would sort of look like was um, we do a, a physical session. So we would do like a gym session or um, some sort of physical activity to try and keep your fitness up, which is pretty important. And then we'd spend a big day on the water. Um, and so as part of that, we would do drills where we would practice starting techniques, we would practice um, tactical things. So making sure you're attacking on the right shifts or even practicing things like pulling the breeze. Um, and, and basically then applying that in a racing setting with six or seven other people who are out on the water racing with us. So um, yeah, that, that was just the general kind of structure for our days. And then we would apply that in like a regatta setting. So all like a weekend sailing setting. So we might do um, like an interclub event or like a centerboard sailing day where you go out, you'd apply the things you'd learn in your drills and um, get to learn a little bit from that thing where you came against your peers and also getting a little bit of a rivalry going as well. Yeah, nice. And it sounds like that's something that, you know, you can apply later in life and uh, we'll get into some of the one design stuff that you've done, but um, yeah. that all of those techniques is, can kind of carry through to training and coaching and, and stuff that, you know, people could do if they're, say, racing on a club team as well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely things you can. And I still use some of the things that I learned through that program and through those learned cell programs, even now, um, to brush up on skills and refine them. Yeah, nice. Yeah. And so what are you, you've actually um, done very well as well in some kind of local and international competitions. Talk us through some of, you know, maybe pick three or four of the achievements you're most proud of and talk us through some of those and what you've done. Um, uh, I guess, um, so probably one of the biggest things for me was a personal achievement was winning the Harkin International Youth Regatta. So that was in 2014. And with a team of girls. So we worked really hard as a team to kind of build up our skills, beat up on the boys a little bit. Um, and so that was a, a massive goal for us to win a Harkin. Um, and then in, I think it was 2016, um, I went and did the Uni Worlds over in Perth. And that again was an all girls team. And we managed to take that win away, um, which was pretty awesome for, for that. Um, and then more recently, I've been doing a bit more Far 40 stuff. So um, we went over to America. I've been to America twice now with the Far 40 on a team called Ed Egg, um, and by Jeff Carter. And he's put together a really cool program. So we went and did um, the Worlds in Chicago two years ago. And then last year, we went to Long Beach and competed there. And we took away first Corinthian. So Corinthian is your like non-professional team. So there's certain rules that you have to um, abide by to be within that category. Um, and we were third overall. So that's including all the professional teams as well. Yeah. So that was a pretty cool achievement for us. Yeah, that's um, an amazing result, especially competing against local teams as well. So of course, yeah. it makes such a difference, doesn't it? Yeah, and massive learning curve. I mean, it's so different sailing in a place like California compared to pit water. Um, just the breeze is different, the, the water's different, tide's different, there's different obstacles. So it was pretty tricky, but really, really cool experience. Yeah, okay. Uh, it's interesting to kind of look at, I mean, what, I guess, could you take away from that as a learning that maybe, you know, you could apply somewhere else or if you went back there, you know, when it comes to trying to deal with different breeze, different water, different obstacles and things that you're not so yeah. familiar with? I think... Um, the biggest thing is taking notes of different places that you are sailing. So, you know, I've jotted down a couple of things that I took away from it um, because the water temperature is different. The breeze feels different. So it doesn't look as windy or feel as windy as it actually is. And um, also talking to local people about what the particular patterns of a place are. So you talk to any of the locals there and they go, yep, you're going to get this number and it's going to clock five degrees to the left um, and having that little bit of knowledge on your side so when you see see those patterns you can go oh I wonder if that's what's going to happen here and then you can sort of play it out and it's not as as much of a surprise mm -hmm. um, 
yeah, that'd probably be the biggest thing. Um, yeah, that's. Yeah, I think that's interesting, the local knowledge stuff. I know when I went down with a team last year and did the Australian Women's Keelboat Regatta, which yeah. unfortunately we can't do this year, but it's sad. Um, <laughs> it's yeah, little, like yeah. everything. <laughs> um, but that was one thing that, you know, uh, we were there a couple of years, but we kind of spoke to some of the locals and got some local knowledge, which I think was very helpful for us as well. So mm -hmm. just kind of understanding and also understanding, okay, there's actually, you know, shipping movements that you have to really know about in Melbourne or mm -hmm. um, where am I likely to run up on a sandbar and things like that which you know when you're racing you may not think of as intuitively especially if you're used to a place where there aren't sandbars to run up on so yeah, yeah. it's those technical things too like um, in California there's a lot of kelp and there's obviously not a lot of kelp in Sydney and oh. so they have kelp sticks so if you run over kelp it can make a huge difference to your boat speed and it can mean that you're obviously not going as fast as your competitors so you've got to get rid of it um, so learning to kelp cut is probably a skill that we would brush up on again if we were going to go back there because when we got there we couldn't do it. <laughs> so what does that mean? I've never actually heard that term before. When you say kelp cut, what is that? <laughs> kelp cut. So um, basically cut kelp off, your, off the keel or the rudder. So um, they've got essentially like a big long stick that's a bit bendy with some rope that's been applied to the outside of it with a big knot on the end and you can drag it along the side of your hull to try to flick off okay interesting while you're racing because obviously to do it back down or to stop and go backwards and get the the kelp off is not particularly efficient or fast no. when you're racing yeah. um so if you've got that skill then that's yeah. an advantage essentially so that's something you can actually do it's set up so you can do that while you're like in the middle of the race you don't have to wait into between races yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so if okay. you really good at it you can just cut it <laughs> yeah, nice. well take notes of these sailors or you know most sailors if you ever go to california um because uh, yeah kelp isn't really a thing we have to deal with here so no <laughs> no something very different for us yeah um, so Alice, I wanted to kind of also have a bit of a chat around, you know, just a little bit, kind of pulling on some of your one design um, experience. Maybe talk us through, for people who have done more club racing or offshore racing, what are some of the main differences between, you say, your typical kind of club racing and one design racing? Um, so I think the biggest difference is that every boat is exactly the same. So obviously with some small differences, but they generally go about the same speed. And so you're finishing at the same time relatively. So you're literally racing people as you see them on the water, um, which makes it a little bit more fast paced, um, probably makes it a little bit more rules dependent. So you really need to know what's going on around you and be able to make split split second decisions essentially so that you're in the best positions yeah um, and you you tend to be sailing with teams that are really tight knit really clean and tidy with mark roundings with start sequences with drops um so if you make a small mistake you're out the back door pretty quickly but at the same time if your competitor makes a mistake there's ways to to get ahead again quite easily. Whereas I suppose with um, with club racing, you have different styles of boat, different types of boat. You might have a few different people with different experiences. Um, some who might have been doing it for the last 20 years and are really tight and knit. And then others who are just starting to get back into it and, and starting to learn or have just got a new boat. So um, you see, I guess, uh, in the moment um, where you're at, against your competitors as opposed to having to wait and see what the results show at the end of the day. And I guess that that makes um, a big difference to your tactics as well. So because you, you're right with your competitors, but also, like you said, any small change, you're at the back door. So if you go one side, everyone else goes the other side, then yeah. you're either a big winner or a big loser normally. So, I mean, I know yeah. that that's not really your, your, you're not the tactician normally on the boat. So, um, but, you know, what kind of, I guess, thoughts do you have around tactics that you could, you know, that would be quite different in the one design field. Um, I guess one of the biggest things I've learned is that it's generally like a game of percentages. So you're wanting to, to manage a fleet more so than you are wanting to pick a side, I guess, um, which of course comes into play and in especially in places like Sydney or in Pittwater where it's quite shifty. Um, you can probably play sides a little bit more, but um, say you're sailing somewhere that's really consistent, you're going to be wanting to play to the fleet and position your boat so that you're um, essentially not going to let people get away by yeah. getting a, a ghost puff or, or something like that. 
Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and how about um, boat setup? You know, what what kind of things do, do you need to really think about? I guess maybe a little bit more that would be a bit more important in one design fleet versus club. Um, so obviously, because the boats are so similar, you're looking for half an order boat speed to gain ahead of your competitors. So it's all those little things that make a big difference. Um, we spend a lot of time working on our rig setup and balancing that with our sales. So we've got some professionals who help us with that, um, working to calibrate numbers and things like that so that we've got a really quick, fast boat. We wanted to make systems nice and smooth and clear and clean and concise. So we have everything labeled. We've got marks on all our sheets to do with, you know, if you're gonna do a jibe, you've got, um, so, so for example, if you were loading up your new, your new brace or your new working brace, we've got a mark on that to show where you would load it so that you've got enough room for your bowman to get enough slack, but um, it's not so loose that it's hanging in the water. So you can set things up ahead of time and just put them in the mark, put them in the cleat and they're ready to go. Um, which takes a lot of the thinking out of it and you can just get through. So say we had to do an, a quick jive, yep, everything's ready to go, bang, the boat moves, everyone moves together. Yeah. Um, I think that's too really important what you just said, is that um, to some of the speed of just decision making is where often in clubs, like you'll say, okay, is everyone ready and count down? And, and sometimes that happens, but often, you know, things are moving so fast that I guess you probably have to be able to move quite quickly or make decisions quite quickly. Yeah, for sure. You, 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 it really helps, um, especially with a team, if you've been sailing together for a while or if you get new people on board, if they can anticipate what's going to happen next. So you might be coming up to a ley line where you're, you're likely to jive. And if you can see and, and work out, okay, we're coming up to that ley line, we're probably about to jive, um, getting ready and set up so that when that happens, it's not a big surprise um, yeah. when you're in that spot. Yeah. And, and just thinking that through as well, then with the teams, you know, the communication part of it must be so important. And this is something that I know a lot of sailors struggle with is you've got somebody on the bow and then they're yelling 40 feet back to try to say something to the back and back and forth. And obviously that's not really effective. So, I mean, what kind of, I guess, techniques or tips or something do, do you kind of have around the comms that would make that more efficient? Yeah, so I think some of the best teams I've sailed with, communication is really simple, really clear and really calm. So we never yell, um, everything happens at a pace. And if there's something that goes wrong, we all sort of sit down and we talk about it afterwards as opposed to kind of getting stuck yeah. in the moment. Um, hand signals can be a really good way for the bow to communicate to the back of the boat and sometimes having someone in the middle who can relay information forwards and backwards. So that's often your pit person or your mast, mast person or pit assist who, you know, if you're tacking, they pass that forward to the next person or, you know, depending on what sort of spinnaker set you're doing, they might communicate that so that the front of the team can start to prepare for that. Yeah, and I guess some of that, if you can make it quite quiet as well, you don't necessarily want to tell your competitor, you know, your competitors next to you what you're doing. Um, if you yeah. want to make a quick jibe without them knowing or something, so that makes that quite useful as well. I guess that quiet yeah. comes yeah. the old dummy yeah. jibe. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Dummy jibe or just the the silent ghost jibe or. <laughs> we actually had a few of those um, overseas yeah, yeah. in America. Okay. So we would have we were going downwind, and um, the call was. We're gonna do a, we're gonna do a fake jibe, and then there was kind of this awkward moment where um, we're all like ready for it, ready for it, and the tactician goes, "Yep, yeah, we're gonna do it. No, no, we're gonna do it." And so everyone thought we were actually gonna jibe, yeah. but it meant for us not to jibe. So just that slight mm -hmm. nuance, so that no, we're gonna do it, was enough for us all to kind of doubt <laughs> what the okay. what the was. A bit of yeah, nah, nah, yeah. <laughs> kind of yeah. Oh, 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 oh. And then <laughs> afterwards it was, so, so just little things like that. So being really clear with, okay, if we are going to jive, the call is three, two, one, jiving. Yeah. If you're not going to jive, it's a three, two, one. We're not, we're not actually going. <laughs> <laughs> Hold, so that's thing. Holding. Holding. <laughs> yeah. I, I, thinking about when you were in America, I mean, are there any kind of, I guess, differences you really picked up between the Australian teams and the American or the other international teams? Was there anything obvious or were they all fairly, like how they run the boat, how they set up the boat, their comms, was it fairly consistent? It's hard to know. Um, 
because I haven't, we haven't really made all the other teams. Yeah, yeah, there, so it's hard to hear what their comms and stuff would be like. But um, I think that uh, different cultures have different ways of communicating. Um, there's a team I can think of who, they were very loud. They were very boisterous. They kind of talked a lot amongst each other and we could hear them. Whereas yeah. the other teams were probably a lot quieter and sort of kept to themselves. And, um, and we were probably a bit more boisterous and a little bit more loud compared to some of the American teams, as you'd expect. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think um, there's general consensus among most teams from most places that communication should be clear, should be concise, should be simple. Um, and yeah, that there shouldn't be too much commotion or too much yelling on a team. Yeah, yeah, definitely makes it pleasant for everyone as well, doesn't it? As well as and if you, yeah, at the end of the day, if you're having a good time, you're probably going to do well. Whereas if you're not having a fun time, then the boat's probably not going to do well. So if the first thing you focus on is having a good time, getting together, going sailing and doing what you love, then you're likely to have a better result. Yeah. Um, as opposed to if you're out there trying to win and, <laughs> and butting heads. Yeah, makes sense. Totally makes sense. And so yeah. what if, um, you know, if there's some of our listeners who maybe haven't done any one design racing, but interested to get involved or would be interested to move into that, what tips do you have for people um, looking to kind of, yeah, move into or find a crewing position, say, in one design racing, or maybe buy a one design yacht and put together a tip? Yeah, so um, I think the biggest thing is that, it's just about talking to people and expressing your interest because boats are always looking for crew and you might have to start off just by doing, um, you know, helping out with the training session or helping out with things like sail testing or um, doing things like that. Just popping in and just being involved in those sessions is a really good way to get your foot in the door, get yourself known. And then there's always times where someone's either sick or pulls out or something's not quite worked with the original team. And there you go, you get your spot to join in. Um, so that would probably be my biggest thing. And also just, um, just brushing up on your skills. So you've got something that you can really offer to a team. Mm -hmm. So whether that's, you know, you're really good with, um, you're really good with ropes, you're really good with splicing, you're really good with, um, you know, those extra little bits and pieces you can help to tidy up the boat, or maybe you're good at data analysis and you can start to provide a bit of assistance mm -hmm. in that tactical kind of area. That's um, an interesting one, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, or maybe, you know, maybe you're a good breeze, you're good at reading the breeze and you can provide that strategical input. Um, all those little bits and pieces are, are skills and things that will help you get asked back onto a team and will help people go, oh, actually, yeah, so-and-so did a really good job. I also noted that they did a really good job of this skill. We should get them back on board. Yeah. Yeah, that all makes sense. Um, I guess also just being a a nice person to have on the team and kind of getting along with the team as you said that kind of team yeah yeah it could even be, so exactly it could even be things like oh yeah like I'll, I'll put my hand up i'll grab some stuff for lunch and i'll help you with that like even little things like that make a big difference and can actually help them bring up the performance of a team so if you're contributing things like that um it's more likely that you're gonna get yeah back and yeah yeah sure. that makes sense so um alice when you're not Sailing, um, you also are a physiotherapist now, which um, I guess before we kind of get into, I've got a few questions that I want to ask you that kind of relate to physiotherapy for sailing, but what made you decide to get into physiotherapy? What, what kind of drew you to that? That's a very good question. <laughs> um, it's a curveball. Uh, I have to <laughs> No, well, I love exercise. I love movement. I love working with people. Um, I, love I love our sailing sport. So... I kind of was like, oh, how can I mesh all these things I really enjoy doing? And physio just seemed like the perfect pathway. Um, and it has been really good. So it's a great way. My job's awesome. I get to work with people. I get to do exercise. I teach Pilates. Um, and I get to treat a lot of sailors. So that's nice too. Yeah. <laughs> Including me once with my, I don't want to be an angler yeah. or something. I came down and I was like, Alice, please help me. <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, I only one. <laughs> um, so with people kind of stuck at home now, and I know a lot of people are probably not really getting their sailing fix much or at all, um, and itching to get back out on the water, what can they do to stay fit and to use this time so that when they do get back out sailing that, you know, they're kind of fit and ready to go? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, I think the biggest thing is using this time to get on top of 
any sort of niggles, niggles, pains, aches that you've got because uh, I think I see a culture amongst sailors in particular where we kind of go, oh yeah, my elbow's a bit sore, but it's fine. It's nothing. It's just a, it's just a tennis elbow. It's nothing like it'll, it'll get better. Or, oh, my back's a bit sore, but I'll take some ibuprofen and it, it's nothing. It's fine. It's just back pain because I sit at a desk. Um, but it, it's not, <laughs> it's, it's sort of a, um, it's sort of realizing that, okay, now you've got an opportunity where you can get on top of these niggles. It's your body's way of telling you that maybe there's a little white flag. It's weight raising to say, pay attention to this area, get it stronger so that when you get back on the boat or back on a team or start sailing again, you get back on, you feel strong and you realize, hey, actually my back doesn't hurt when I'm hiking or hey, my tennis elbow doesn't hurt as much. Um, and it just empowers you a little bit more. Mm. That'd probably be the first thing I would do because I see a lot of sailors with chronic injuries okay. um, who just go through the motions with it um and, and it, yeah now is the perfect opportunity to get on top of those um and i guess the other thing too is is looking at ways to to just keep up your fitness so sailing is um what i'd classify as like an anaerobic sport so that's short sharp bursts of energy as opposed to like a big long run Okay. okay, so so for that sort of exercise, you want to be training up specific things. So you want to be looking at um, short, sharp bursts of energy. So looking at hip style workouts or sprints or um, anything that challenges your, your cardiovascular system so that you get that quick burst and then a bit of recovery, quick burst and recovery. Um, that and also just getting strong. Okay. And yeah. I guess a lot of that stuff people can do at home, right? Do you have any kind of suggestions of things that people could do at home or maybe, you know, that would be allowed? Um, we've got people <laughs> on from different parts of Australia and New Zealand. Um, so everyone's rules are slightly different, but, you know, most people I think are at least allowed to get out and go around the block or they can do something, of course, at home. So what would be, I guess, a few things people could do? Yeah, so um, I would start off just by getting moving. So just if you're, if you're someone who doesn't normally exercise, find a way, whether it's a walk, whether it's a run, whether it's a swim, if you're lucky enough, like we are, we can go out yeah. for a swim in the ocean. Um, and once you start, then building on that so that you're starting to get a little bit more of that anaerobic style exercise. So um, for example, I've been doing a bit of running, I'll go, I'll do a sprint and then I'll have a short recovery. And then I'll sprint again and then I'll take a recovery. Um, so that would be one way. Um, it's also worth looking into whether or not you can um, either get your back or hip or knee or whatever it is that's niggling you assessed and then start a rehab program at home. I feel like now is like the perfect time to do that <laughs> while you're, you're at home. But um, by getting that started, at least by the time we're finally allowed to go back out, you built up your strength again and you're back to it. And it could be as simple as, um, you know, using things like tin cans as weights or, um, you know, being a little bit creative with, you know, using books as steps or um, playing around with some of the furniture in your house, doing squats to a chair, learning to do a push up. Um, I've been learning to do handstands, um, that sort of thing. So that you, you're training your body up um, and, and just sort of making advantage of what you've got around you. Um, um, okay, great. And we've got a question actually from our audience. So um, Brian asks, um, do you employ any um, mediation, oh, sorry, meditation techniques as part of uh, your race preparation? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. And I think a really important and valuable tool. Um, yes, I do. Um, I practice a little bit of mindfulness. So if I'm feeling a little bit stressed, a little bit worried about an important race day, um, and in particular, I experienced this when I was match racing because everything kind of comes down to a finals and it's win or lose. So there's a lot of pressure. Um, so in that situation, you know, I would do things like listen to a mindfulness meditation and, and go for a quiet walk or something like that. But yeah, I think it's a really valuable way to, to help calm, calm you down um, and, and get you in the zone before you compete. The other thing I found really helpful is actually just completely distracting myself from what the stressor is. So it might just be, okay, we're in the car on the way to racing. I'm going to read a book. I'm going to do something completely, completely different. I'm not going to worry about the weather patterns. I'm not going to worry about X, Y, Z. I've done as much prep as I can. I'm just going to focus on 
something completely different or listen to music or yeah something that's just completely removed it's interesting i guess because most people would think they're going into a big competition they need to spend every you know all the time that they have to kind of get ready and to prep or to prep the boat or themselves or get you know check the weather like you said but um if you've done that ahead of time and you're fully prepped then you've got some time to relax and i guess that would be a really good way to kind of get into the zone yeah well the, the worst thing that could happen so i've actually had experiences with this before where you you work really hard and you work really hard t for too long. And so right before competition day, you're tired because you've been at the boat working on it all day, trying to get things ready. Everyone's a little bit grumpy. Maybe you've done a dip. So you've tried to lose weight for a weigh-in to help get the team in. Um, and then when you finally get to go racing, yeah, you're really prepared, but you're exhausted. So if you can find ways to taper, so whether it is, taking your mind off it with some walking, whether it is building in days before a competition where you have some downtime, where everyone goes and does something fun or you, you do something a little bit different, then that's a really good way. And I found that actually boosts performance um, mm. as opposed to just going, going, going. Yeah, that's interesting. And I know like, I know that you did your first um, Sydney Hobart yacht race um, yeah. last year. And um, that's something that, you know, I've, whenever I've done it, I've always, Christmas day is my day just to be quiet, to do go for a kayak or to do something really quiet and just have a relaxed day. But I know there are lots of people that do go down and do those last minute jobs on Christmas day. But like you said, if you've done so much prep, then that's a really, you know, good time to kind of just relax. You're about to go on a like a really long race, you know, get some sleep. Don't drink too yeah. much. <laughs> drink it. Exactly. <laughs> So what, I guess what did, um, you know, talk, let, talk us a little bit about your first Sydney Hobart and what did you do to prep? This is another curveball question that I'm throwing in a little bit, yeah. place, but it kind of be interesting to know kind of how you kind of manage that. Yeah, no, it was um, really awesome. Probably one of the best races I've ever done. Um, it was quite a long, long prep. So we sort of identified we wanted to do the race maybe a year or so out and then went through and did a heap of the Blue Water Series, Southport, Coffs, um, or what was Pit Water to Southport, sorry, from RPA. Yep. And did those races. And then we spent a couple of days working on the boat and there were a few people who would spend a little bit extra time down there and we all kind of would put in a little bit to try and get the boat ready. Um, and then maybe two weeks out. So we basically had our boat ready to go, um, pretty much almost perfect, ready for the Hobart in sort of June, July. So ready for the Southport race. And from then on, it was just to boost from there. Um, and I think that worked really well because it took a lot of that stress, I guess, out of it. We knew the boat was ready um, and we knew it was just the crew. We just had to get that down. Yeah. Um, so that was really cool. But yeah, and then sort of in the week or two before the Hobart race, it was all about that taper. So I was trying to eat really well, trying to exercise, trying to keep moving, trying not to fall into the holiday loop of <laughs> going to eat lots of plum pudding. And <laughs> um, and then, yeah, um, on Christmas Day, very chilled, very relaxed and ready to go on Boxing Day. Yeah, okay. Did you do anything to, um, I guess, physically to train yourself in the lead up? Um, any specific exercise program or anything like that? Yeah, no, I did. So um, I've been working with one of the trainers up at um, Royal Prince Alfred Yacht Club, um, who's awesome. And she's been helping me. When I go home from work, the last thing I feel like thinking about is what can I do to get my body really strong? I kind of would like someone to guide me a little bit through that so I can just do the work. Um, and so she helped me basically with getting stronger. So I do a lot of trimming on the boat. Um, so working on upper body strength, core, those sorts of things. Um, yeah, and just also trying to make sure I was in top top shape health wise. So um, followed a good diet. So I think that's one of the biggest things um, is actually making sure you're eating good, healthy food. So your body is well nourished. So when you do go offshore and you're probably not eating as much as normal or you're eating differently, um, you're not sleeping well, you've got stress, you're cold, all those things start to, to build up. At least you've got this good baseline so that when you do have a little drop, it's not like you're skyrocketing down or you're, you're falling right down. You're, you're staying just below a baseline. Um, so I tend to do that before I do any ocean races anyway. Um, yeah. 
it just helps you stay a bit more on your yeah. game. <laughs> yeah. yeah at least a good starting point so you when you yeah. fall you don't fall quite as far <laughs> hopefully um anything you do like during a, a big ocean race like a Sydney Hobart to kind of keep yourself I guess n a bit nimble or not to get too many because it's easy to get aches and pains and stuff do you kind of do anything while you're out there on the water yeah I try to um <laughs> it is hard and because you're sitting a lot you tend to get so tight through through shoulders through hips um, I think two years ago or something, we were doing a Southport race and we were doing rail Pilates. So we're doing little exercises on the, the side of the boat. But things like when you are when you are hiking, reaching behind and just trying to stretch out your chest, um, you know, popping your leg over the side a little bit more so and twisting into a little hip flexor stretch, things like that will all be helpful. But I also think probably what was even more valuable than all of that was mindset. So basically trying to exercise your brain so that you don't get stuck into that, oh, why am I here? What's going on? Sort of feeling that I know some people can get. Um, for me, I find it relatively easy because I love it and I'm there and I'm like, yes, I'm at sea, I'm with friends, I'm doing something that's really exciting for me. And it's just talking that mantra and yeah, like this is a choice, I'm happy to be here and it's exciting. Um, that really helps to motivate me and keep me going even when it's two o'clock in the morning and I've had to pack three sails and I'm wet and cold and yeah. you know even when it's not the most fun and then when you have those moments that are really good you go pop that was epic we just hit 25 boats 25 knots of boat speed on our little boat <laughs> that's cool um that's why that's why I do it yeah um, so just focusing on those things and, and having that internal chat can make a big difference to how you feel when you're out off, offshore yeah yeah, no, no, that make, that makes a lot of sense. And I guess it's kind of like you're in a team again. So, you know, if you look to the rest of your teammates to kind of help, like, you know, in one design racing, that's, you know, a team cohesion for short periods of time and offshore, it's team cohesion for a long period of time where they can hopefully yeah. help bring you off a bit as well. Yeah, um, exactly. Exactly. The more like positivity you can bring to the team, the better you're going to do and the more yeah. comfortable and happy everyone's going to be. So, Yeah. Yeah, positivity is a good message for right now as well, isn't it? Um, so Brian had another question. He liked my miss, um, miss speaking of meditation. So he asked maybe mediation is a good question as well. Um, and so how do you handle a protest and stop crew from being spooked? So I guess okay. thinking about your match racing and, and some of that stuff that you've done, um, that would be a good kind of example. Yeah, so protests always feel a bit yucky. Um, I don't love protests, but they are part of the sport, is part of it. Um, I think the biggest thing to keep in mind is that you just have to go in there knowing your rules and it also helps to know your rules before you get into that incident in the first place. So brushing up on your rules before you go sailing is a great way to start. So that when something does happen, you can go back and you can go, okay, clearly this was a violation of this rule. Um, and then once you get into the rule, into the room, you can be really clear about it. You can be really clinical about it. Just like if you were, you know, in a, um, in a, um, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? If you're in a um, court situation and they're literally talking about, okay, this is the, the position. This is what the law says this is what our understanding of that or our interpretation of that is. Um, and just remembering that we're all here for a bit of fun. We're all here to have a good time. And uh, even when it's the highest stakes, so or even when it is, um, you know, you're, you're racing at a high level or you're chasing a goal that's really important to you, um, that, that, you know, if you've done everything that you can to know the rules and to, um, to, to, to act towards them as best as possible, then what happens in the room happens in the room. And as long as you back yourself and you're positive about it, yeah, you, you've done the best that you can. Yeah, I guess it's that like positivity and preparation again. Yeah, um, yeah. And kind of talking um, about preparation, going back to kind of, I guess, some of your experience as a physio, um, you know, if people are, people are, we've given people some tips, I guess, to kind of get fit and stay fit in the lead up to sailing, but once I get back into sailing, you know, what if, maybe pick your top three tips of what people can do to kind of stay injury free while they, while they are out on the water or in between races? Yeah, um, I think we tend to forget how physical sailing is. 
Um, Because it can go from, you know, a lovely twilight sail that's pretty cruisy to suddenly it's really windy and, you know, you've got to move heavy things or drop heavy sails and it can start to get a bit trickier and um, that's when people can get injured. They try and pick up something heavy and they hurt their back or um, they're a little bit overloaded and they can't turn a winch handle. So I think the biggest thing is staying strong even when you are racing. So making sure you're doing something that helps to keep you strong and fit. Making sure you're working on your cardiovascular fitness so that when you get out there, you can keep up and you can help win mark roundings. You can help in those other situations where you're having to do a quick burst of energy. Um, and, and also, if you have an injury, make sure you get it looked at so that um, it's not interfering with you all the time. Um, I'm actually looking at putting together because this has been something that's come up quite a bit um, with sailors and especially now, but um, putting together some programs that focus on specific sailing injuries that okay. people can, can do through like an online um, service where they can quickly jump on, do some exercises that are tailored to their injury so they get back on the boat and they're feeling strong and fit. Um, so I'm looking at setting that up over the next week or two. Um, if people are interested in something like that. So I think that would be a need for it. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. And um, please um, definitely share that with us and we'll make sure we send it out to everyone who attended and share it out, you know, to, to the people who are watching as well so that if they're interested, they can, yeah, they can get involved. Yeah, I'll be putting together a little bit of a mailing list for people who are interested. So I'll give you my um, email address and stuff and if people just flick through, the name, contact details and what sort of areas or injuries they have so that I get a good idea of what's going on and then we can come up with a plan to try and get them sailing fit again. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, that sounds like a great idea. And one of the things that people like to do when they get, well, as soon as they've crossed the finish line usually or sometimes before or when they get back to the dock is, you know, they sit down and have a drink or have a few drinks or quite a few drinks. Um, <laughs> probably not the best way to recover. I mean, I'm not saying that you shouldn't do that, like have a great time, but um, what, like, what would be your kind of, I guess, suggestions for people about how they can, what they should or what they could do after a race to kind of help them recover so that they don't kind of get injured in the long run? Yeah, no, really good point. Um, what's really interesting is there's actually a couple of studies that actually say that a light beer, one standard drink of a light beer is actually a really good recovery um, way to recover. It's okay. got the carbohydrates and things that you need in it. So maybe stick to just the one. <laughs> um, I think the biggest thing I see is that people are so dehydrated um, when they get off the water. People don't drink enough when they're on the water. And then when you get off and you start to drink alcohol, which is essentially a, a diuretic, which helps you expel water, you're just going to be dehydrating your body more. So like Deb's doing now. Um, That's water. Make, make sure you're drinking water. It's something really simple, but water is so important for your body functions. And if you don't have enough of it, um, you're going to end up with niggles and aches and feeling stiff and headachey. So that would probably be my, my biggest thing. Um, and especially, so I think in the context of ocean racing, um, you're exhausted, you're depleted, you're dehydrated, probably a little bit sunburnt, but you're also stiff. So sometimes the best thing you can do is actually get up, get moving, get walking, get into a pool, maybe do a little bit of a swim, those sorts of things where you're just starting to get the joints moving again and get your body feeling a little bit more mobile will be really beneficial um, in your recovery and drink water. <laughs> yeah. yeah, good idea. Yeah, this year when I got to Hobart, after Sydney Hobart, I, the next day, I think it was, I went and got a massage and I have to say it was so good. It was just Yeah, really yeah treat yourself like you've yeah. achieved something huge. Um, go and do something that makes your body feel good. Go have a big meal with your friends and your, your crew. Go have a massage. Go for a beautiful walk in the location that you've arrived to. Um, yeah, treat yourself. And the same with a regatta on the weekend. I think we kind of go, okay, we're going to do Saturday, Sunday. We're racing right through Sunday night, get ready for work, Monday morning, get up and go. Take Sunday night as a recovery. Take it as your me time. Settle down the brain, have a nice long bath, you know, have a glass of water, stretch, focus on your, your, your stiff areas, um, back, shoulders, knees, whatever that might be. Um, and yeah, just take that little bit of extra me time. 
Yeah, I like it. Um, so I've got one more question for Alice, um, but before I do, I just want to say anybody who's um, logged into, we've got some people watching us live on Facebook, but anyone who's logged into the Zoom webinar, if you've got more questions, just pop them in that Q&A um, and we'll come back and answer those kind of before we finish. Um, but Alice, what, you're working I think full time now, aren't you? Um, yes. So probably cuts into the sailing time a little bit, but what's next um, for you and for, as far as your sailing goes? Um, so at this point in time, we're hoping, hoping to um, do Far 40 Worlds this year. We'll see. That was supposed to be November in Sydney, which would have been really cool. Um, yep. Home ground um, and a title to defend. Um, yep. So that's sort of the next thing. And then uh, it was going to be some more ocean racing. So working towards Southport, Hobart. And then I'm hoping to try and get a ride in the Sydney to Auckland race. Nice. Um, but got a little bit of work to do to try and, and work around that and make sure I can get time off work and all those <laughs> fun things. Um, but yeah, that's sort of what I'm looking at. But at the moment, it's just about um, getting through what's happening at the moment, focusing on a few things for my body, a few things for, for um, work, a few things for my patients. Yeah, just kind of, kind of stripping things down and building back up again. So it's kind of nice to have a little bit of quiet time. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Actually, as much as it's sad not to get out on the water, it's, you know, I guess time to do other things if we want to be positive. So, which is yeah. tonight, positive. Yeah, it's about kind of making the most of it. Yeah, learn to do a handstand. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, little things like that. So, um, well, anyone who's listening, Alice is looking for a spot for Sydney Auckland. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, anybody who's who's looking for some crew for Sydney Auckland, you probably have two people, two panelists tonight who could be interested. So. <laughs> yeah, no, that's definitely one that's on my bucket list. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm happy to do that. And I'm keen to do a little bit more. Um, I haven't really done a lot of deliveries or a lot of that style of sailing. And I feel like that, that would be something that I'm pretty interested in doing as well. So depending on work and because I did take quite a bit of time off last year to do some one design far 40s and also to do some match racing stuff. Um, yeah. This year's probably a little bit about stripping back, just focusing on one or two things and maybe spending a little bit more time doing some ocean miles. Yeah, nice. Yeah. Okay, yeah. well, we don't have any more questions um, in the chat. So look, I think we'll wrap it up there. And um, Alice, I just want to thank you again so much for giving us your time tonight um, and all of those really great tips. Um, and um, yeah, so for everybody who's been listening in, um, just keep a lookout and I'll share Alice's programs once um, or the contact details, you know, once I get those so that you can kind of get in touch. Um, and I could probably use some of that myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> lots of swimming and got the shoulder of all injured so yeah so you yeah you, 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 I think we're all you yeah yeah too much sitting in front of this computer as well so so yeah so thank you thank you again Alice and thank you to everyone who's joined us tonight and uh, we'll see you again next week thanks so much for having me thanks for listening guys it's really really lovely to chat yeah thank you bye everybody bye Thanks everyone for tuning in. If you'd like to know more about this program or the MySail app and community, head on over to MySail.team. That's M-Y-S-A-I-L dot T-E-A-M. Until next time, stay safe and happy sailing.